just want to start off with um, just a, an update on um, some of the talks that I gave uh, last year um, on the, the big news of last year in, in the disclosure world, which was really the, the Jackson reforms. Um, and I don't want to go in that, into that in any, any real depth uh, as to how those are working in practice, but um, there were two main points to Jackson as, as far as disclosure was concerned. Um, first was to make uh, the whole disclosure process much more efficient by uh, trying to agree the scope of, of the party searches up front, uh, aiming to eliminate, eliminate the, the risk of parties going off on a frolic of their own, uh, and later having big arguments and and uh, applications for specific disclosure when when disclosure was given, um, the other side of the the the, the other point uh, to Jackson was really to try to reduce the volume of of disclosure given, um, and move away from standard disclosure as the the default uh, option to something that was more focused on what the case actually requires. Um, and relegating standard disclosure to one of just six um, options. Um, anecdotally, over the last nearly 18 months uh, that the, uh, the reforms have been in place, uh, we've not seen a great deal of change. Um, standard disclosure still seems to be the default option for most um, parties, and there's not been that much pushback from the majority of, of judges. Um, I know in a few cases, Adelshaw Goddard have, have pressed for um, issue-based disclosure and other um, more funky um, menu options. Um, and in some cases that's worked, uh, in some cases it's, it's, it's not. Um, the, the judge has just gone with, with um, standard disclosure. Um, Clive Friedman, um, a barrister at uh, 3VB, runs a, a very good website, uh, edisclosure.uk.com. Um, and he's published some initial results of a survey um, that he's conducted um, of, of users of his, his website. So it's a slightly self-selecting sample of people who you'd expect to be more on top of e-disclosure issues and, and potentially um, uh, pioneering uh, these, these reforms. Um, but um, the, the headline points from his small sample of 29 uh, cases bears out my, my anecdotal evidence. Uh, 72 of those cases opted for um, standard disclosure. Um, and other results um, in relation to other questions that uh, his survey asked has, has shown that really very little has actually changed in the way uh, that um, people have, have, dis have been conducting disclosure post-Jackson. I think um, there haven't been any really seminal cases on, on, on these points yet, but I think um, there the will be um, some things coming. Um, really, the move to... Um, agreed disclosure up front has meant that at least certain issues are aired um, and dealt with early on, which I think has been sensible and has worked it well in, in a number of cases um, that we've worked on. Um, but um, in my experience on, on one particular um, big case, which is very contentious, very hard fought, massive sums of money at, at stake, um, the, uh, re the reforms have really just provided an opportunity to have a really big argument at the CMC over what disclosure will look like. Um, and then after disclosure has been given, there's another really big argument um, about, uh, about gaps in disclosure. And there are specific uh, disclosure applications on foot, which um, essentially the whole point of the new process was that that was, that was to be avoided. Um, Moving on, um, we're involved in um, one of uh, the biggest cases in the commercial court um, at the moment, uh, and um, one satellite part of that uh, relates to a, a committal hearing um, relating to uh, electronic data that was obtained uh, allegedly through hacking um, and the alleged breach of an undertaking uh, in relation to the handling of that data. Uh, that um, committal hearing is part heard and remains adjourned, so I'm not going to talk about it in any, any detail. Um, but I'd just like to talk through um, some other cases um, that highlight the risks involved um, in handling electronic data um, throughout a case. Um, first case is um, Cole and uh, Floriat. Um, and this um, is a cautionary tale for, for lawyers drafting undertakings and orders. Um, and it's certainly a, a warning to um, clients to make sure that your, your um, lawyers are, are savvy in these, in these issues. Um, 
There was a dispute over the ownership and nature of data on a computer that had been seized. Um, and an undertaking was given um, that uh, a firm of solicitors would not part with possession of the computer or allow any party access, uh, any, any party to access, open or interfere with the computer uh, other than by agreement of the parties or order of the court. Um, now, the applicant sought a, a committal um, for breach of that undertaking. Um, and what had happened was that um, before the undertaking was negotiated, a forensic image of that uh, computer had been taken. <clears throat> and uh, a firm of solicitors that had given the undertaking and others um, had searched and reviewed the, uh, the content in that image of the, the computer. Um, and when it came to giving the undertakings, um, had been very, very careful not to give uh, undertakings in respect of, of reviewing or uh, part, the past review or any future review of, of that data. Um, and the applicant submitted uh, that the true construction of the, the undertaking was that the, uh, the wording extended to the data and thus to the image and the contents um, and preclude, precluded the searching of that image. Uh, as well as the, the physical computer itself, which was it was common ground that that hadn't been touched. Uh, that argument was rejected by the judge and uh, the construction was construed in favour of the party giving the undertaking. And I think the moral of the story there is that you've got to be very clear in any order or undertaking when dealing with electronic documents. You've got to think about each and every layer of the data, information, media that you want to protect and or restrict access to. Um, and lawyers need to be very savvy about the nature of, of what can be done with, with documents and electronic data in particular. You know, it's very easy to think of everything as analogous to a hard copy document. Uh, that's a single physical object. Um, with electronic data, you've got the physical container, um, the, the hard drive or whatever. Um, you've got potential forensic copies. You've got the file and the data and the folder structure documents themselves, the text of those documents, contents of, of uh, spreadsheets, etc., metadata about that document as well. You've got to make sure you, you think of all of those issues. Um, you need to be really careful when handling documents generally. Um, they're delicate and sensitive, but they're also live things. Uh, they can change, replicate, propagate through a system um, with little or no human intervention. And... Um, most people with a, a litigation and a, a particularly a fraud litigation background know that it's important to collect data forensically, uh, not just have a quick look at a, a laptop without securing the data. Um, but familiarity, I think, means that it's, it's very tempting to have a quick look at a document or something on a computer. Um, I know of at least one case from a reputable source where the solicitor, um, who's not someone at AG, had a quick look at the... Um, the emails of a suspected rogue employee um, putting the uh, PST file of that employee into their own outlook. And um, the accomplice of that rogue started receiving read receipts from a partner at that city law firm and was tipped off uh, to cover their tracks. Um, lots of uh, lawyers in the case of, of Shepherd and Fox Williams um, shows that... Uh, Employee, employers might not be entitled to see uh, privileged documents held by their um, employees on their servers, even if um, the electronic information and computer use policies assert that they can monitor and access um, those documents. Uh, this case um, concerned the potential waiver of privilege in highly confidential documents by the claimant uh, that he had emailed to his girlfriend's webmail account who in turn had emailed those, uh, those same emails to her work address and then accessed uh, them at work to review, edit and comment on them. Um, the girlfriend subsequently became involved in proceedings with her former employees, uh, Norton Rose, employer, sorry, uh, Norton Rose uh, Fulbright. And in those um, employment proceedings, uh, Norton Rose's uh, solicitors, Fox Williams, disclosed the claimant's documents. Um, Norton Rose uh, Fulbright had this electronic information policy in place, uh, which enabled them to um, carry out uh, monitoring and access uh, the data for appropriate business purposes. Um, the
claimant launched a claim to seek delivery up and or destruction of the uh, purportedly privileged documents. And the key issue turned on the principle that confidentiality and therefore privilege um, in, the, uh, in the documents may be lost if, if a document is made generally available. Um, the defendant submitted that girlfriend had sent the documents with the claimant's authority and knowledge and that um, he should be taken to have consented to um, them being on the, uh, the Norton Rose uh, server. The, and, and so he waived privilege effectively. Court rejected this and held that it would be contrary to the interest of the administration of justice if um, privilege were to be regarded as waived in those um, circumstances. Um, the fact that the claim might not be able to assert privilege against his girlfriend didn't mean that um, he'd waive privilege more generally. Um, and even if the claimant had known of, of Norton Rose's policy, um, the court said that this would not have led him to conclude that privilege and confidentiality would be jeopardised by forwarding uh, those documents to his, his girlfriend for a uh, limited specific purpose, um, especially as she was a, a lawyer herself. Um, I'll just skip over the uh, Chengiz SFO case, um, which relates to the use of... Um, documents in uh, other proceedings, in foreign proceedings, when they've been disclosed in English proceedings. Um, and um, if you want to discuss it more with me, I'm, I'm happy to speak after the um, after this, um, or you can give me a call. Um, but finally, I just thought I'd leave you with a, another piece of exciting news from the, uh, the world of e-disclosure. Um, and there's a, a US film that's been released about e-disclosure, or discovery as uh, they call it over there, um, and it's called um, The Decade of Discovery, um, and it's about a, a government attorney on a quest um, to find a better way to search White House email, um, and a teacher who takes a stand for justice on the electronic frontier. Um, so uh, look out for it at your, your local Odeon. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It's amazing how many cases we yeah. see people have sent emails to their home address or friends' uh, address. And certainly if you're a, a PLC, that can involve inside information. So really, if you only take one thing away, is be careful where you're sending your confidential information.